Leaf and Tendril, The Art of Seeing Things, Part 2. The book of nature is like a page written over or printed upon the different sized characters and in many different languages, interlined and cross-lined and with a great variety of marginal notes and references. There is coarse print and fine print. There are obscure signs and hieroglyphics. We all read the large type more or less appreciatively, but only the students and lovers of nature read the fine lines and the footnotes. It is a book which he reads best who goes most slowly or even tarries long by the way. He who runs may read some things. We may take in the general features of sky, plain, and river from the express train, but only the pedestrian, the saunterer, with eyes in his head and love in his heart, turns every leaf and peruses every line. One may see only the migrating waterfowls and the larger birds of the air. Another sees the passing kinglets and hurrying warblers as well. For my part, my delight is to linger long over each page of the marvelous record and to dwell fondly upon its most obscure text. I take pleasure in noting the minute things about me. I am interested even in the ways of the wild bees and in all the little dramas and tragedies that occur in field and wood. One June day in my walk, as I crossed a rather dry, high-lying field, my attention was attracted by small mounds of fresh earth all over the ground, scarcely more than a handful in each. One, on looking closely, I saw that in the middle of each mound there was a hole not quite so large as a lead pencil. Now I had never observed these mounds before, and my curiosity was aroused. Here is some fine print, I said, that I have overlooked. So I set to work to try to read it. I waited for a sign of life. Presently I saw here and there a bee hovering about over the mounds. It looked like the honey bee, only less pronounced in color and manner. One of them alighted on one of the mounds near me and was about to disappear in the hole in the center when I caught it in my hand. Though it stung me, I retained it and looked it over and in the process was stung several times, but the pain was slight. I saw it was one of our native wild bees, cousin to the leaf rollers that build their nests under the stones and in decayed fence rails. In Packard I found it described under the name of Andrina. Then I inserted a small weed stalk into one of the holes, and with the little trowel I carried proceeded to dig out the nest. The hole was about a foot deep at the bottom of it. I found a little semi-transparent membranous sac or cell a little larger than that of the honeybee. In this sac was a little pellet of yellow pollen, a loaf of bread for the young grub when the egg should have hatched. I explored other nests and found them all the same. This discovery was not a great addition to my sum of natural knowledge, but it was something. Now, when I see the signs in a field, I know what they mean. They indicate the tiny earthen cradles of Andrina. Nearby, I chanced to spy a large hole in the turf with no mound of soil about it. I could put the end of my little finger into it. I peered down and saw the gleam of two small bead-like eyes. I knew it to be the den of the wolf spider. Was she waiting for some blundering insect, insect to tumble in? I say she because the real ogre among the spiders is the female. The male is small and of little consequence. A few days later I paused by this den again and saw the members of the ogres, ogress scattered about her own door. Had some insect Jack the giant killer been there, or had a still more formidable ogress, the sand hornet, dragged her forth and carried her, carried her limbless body to her den in the bank? What the wolf spider does with the earth it excavates in making its den is a mystery. There is no sign of it anywhere about. Does it force its way down by pushing the soil to one side and packing it there firmly? The entrance to the hole usually has a slight rim or hem to keep the edge from crumbling in. As it happened, I chanced upon another interesting footnote that very day. I was on my way to a muck swamp in the woods to see if the showy lady's slipper was in bloom. 
Just on the margin of the swamp in the deep shade of the hemlocks, my eye took note of some small, unshapely creature crawling hurriedly over the ground. I stooped down and saw it was some large species of moth just out of its case and in a great hurry to find a suitable place in which to hang itself up and give its wings a chance to unfold before the air dried them. I thrust a small twig in its way, which it instantly seized upon. I lifted it gently, carried it out to drier ground, and fixed the stick in the fork of a tree so that the moth hung free a few feet from the ground. Its body was distended nearly to the size of one's little finger and surmounted by wings that were so crumpled and stubby that they seemed quite rudimentary. The creature evidently knew what it wanted and knew the importance of haste. Instantly these rude stubby wings began to grow. It was a slow process, but one could see the change from minute to minute. As the wings expanded, the body contracted. By some kind of pumping arrangement, air was being forced from, from a reservoir in the one into the tubes of the other. The wings were not really growing as they at first seemed to be, but they were unfolding and expanding under this pneumatic pressure from the body. In the course of about half an hour the process was, was completed and the winged creature hung there in all its full-fledged beauty. Its color was checked black and white like a loon's back, but its name I know not. My chief interest in it, aside from the interest we feel in any form of in any new form of life arose from the creature's extreme anxiety to reach a perch which it could unfold its wings. A little delay would doubtless have been fatal to it. I wonder how many human geniuses are hatched whose wings are blighted by some accident or untoward circumstance, or do the wings of genius always unfold, no matter what the environment may be. One seldom takes a walk without encountering some of this fine print on nature's page. Now it is a little yellowish-white moth that spreads itself upon the middle of a leaf as if to imitate the droppings of birds, or it is the young cicadas working up out of the ground and in the damp, cool places building little chimneys or tubes above the surface to get more warmth and hasten their development, or it is a, w a wood newt gorging a tree cricket, or a small snake gorging the newt or a bird song with some striking peculiarity, a strange defect, or a rare excellence. Now it is a shrike impaling his victim, or blue jays mocking and teasing a hawk, and dropping quickly into the branches to avoid his angry blows, or a robin hustling a cuckoo out of the tree where her nest is, or a vireo driving away a cowbird, or the partridge blustering about your feet till her young are hidden. One October morning I was walking along the road on the edge of the woods when I came into a gentle shower of butternuts. One of them struck my hat brim. I paused and looked about me. Here one fell, there another, yonder a third. There was no wind blowing, and I wondered what was loosening the butternuts. Turning my attention to the top of the tree, I soon saw the explanation. A red squirrel was at work, gathering his harvest. He would seize a nut give it a twist, when down it would come. Then he would dart to another and another. Farther along I found where he had covered the ground with chestnut burrs. He could not wait for the frost and the winds. Did he know that the burrs would dry and open upon the ground, and that the bitter covering of the butternuts would soon fall away from the nut? There are three things that perhaps happen near me each season that I have never yet seen. The toad casting its skin, the snake swallowing its young, and the larvae of the moth and butterfly constructing their shrouds. It is a mooted question whether or not the snake does swallow its young, but if there is no other good reason for it, may they not retreat into their mother's stomach to feed? How else are they to be nourished? That the moth larva can weave its own cocoon and attach it to a twig seems more incredible Yesterday in my walk I found a firm silver-gray cocoon about two inches long and shaped like an Egyptian mummy, probably Promethea, suspended from a branch of a bush by a narrow stout ribbon twice as long as itself. The fastening was woven around the limb upon which it turned as if it grew there. I would have given 
something to have seen the creature perform this feat and then increase itself so snugly in the silken shroud at the end of the tether. By swinging free, its firm, compact case was in no danger from woodpeckers, as it might have been if resting directly upon the branch or tree trunk. Nearby was the cocoon of another species, Cecropia, that was fastened directly to the limb. But this was vague, loose, and much more involved than net-like. I have seen the downy woodpecker assaulting one of these cocoons, but its yielding surface and webby interior seemed to puzzle and baffle him. I am interested even in the way each climbing plant or vine goes up the pole, whether from right to left or from left to right, that is, with the hands of a clock or against them, whether it is under the law of the great cyclonic storms of the northern hemisphere which all move against the hands of a clock, or in the contrary direction like the cyclones in the southern hemisphere. I take pleasure in noting every little dancing whirlwind of a summer day that catches up the dust or the leaves before me, and every little funnel-shaped whirlpool in the swollen stream or river, whether or not they spin from right to left or the reverse. If I were in the southern hemisphere, I am sure I should note whether these things were under the law of its cyclones in this respect or under the laws, law of ours. As a rule, our twining plants and toy whirlwinds copy our revolving storms and go against the hands of the clock. But there are exceptions. While the bean, the bittersweet, the morning glory, and others go up from left to right, the hop, the wild buckwheat, and some others go up from right to left. Most of our forest trees show a tendency to wind one way or the other. The hardwoods go going in one direction, and the hemlocks and pines and cedars and butternuts and chestnuts in another. In different localities, or on different geological formations, I find these directions reversed. I recall one instance in the case of a hemlock six or seven inches in diameter, where this tendency to twist had come out of the grain, as it were, and shaped the outward form of the tree, causing it to make in an ascent of about thirty feet one complete revolution about a larger tree close to which it grew. On a smaller scale, I have seen the same thing in a pine. Persons lost in the woods or on the plains or traveling at night tend, I believe, toward the left. The movement of men and women, it is said, differ in this respect, one sex turning to the right and the other to the left. I have lived in the world more than fifty years before I noticed a peculiarity about the rays of lights one often sees diverging from an opening or a series of openings in the clouds, namely, that they are like spokes in a wheel, the hub or center of which appears to be just there in the vapory masses instead of being as it really, as is really the case, nearly ninety-three millions of miles beyond. The beams of light that come through cracks or chinks in a wall do not converge in this way, but to the eye run parallel to one another. There is another fact. This fan-shaped display of converging rays is always immediately in front of the observer that is exactly between him and the sun, so that the central spoke or shaft in his front is always perpendicular. You cannot see this fan to the right or left of the sun, but only between you and it. Hence, as in the case of the rainbow, no two persons see exactly the same rays. The eye sees what it has the means of seeing, and its means of seeing are in proportion to the love and desire behind it. The eye is informed and sharpened by the thought. My boy sees ducks on the river where and when I cannot, because at certain seasons he thinks ducks and dreams ducks. One, one season my neighbor asked me if the bees had injured my grapes. I said, no, the bees never injure my grapes. They do mine, he replied. They puncture the skin for the juice, and at times the clusters are covered with them. No, I said, it is not the bees that puncture the skin, it is the birds. What birds? The Orioles. But I haven't seen any Orioles, he rejoined. We have, I continued, because at this season we think Orioles. We have learned by experience how destructive these birds are in the vineyard, and we are on the lookout for them. Our eyes and ears are ready for them. 
If we think birds, we shall see birds wherever we go. If we think arrowheads, as Thoreau did, we shall pick up arrowheads in every field. Some people have an eye for four-leafed clovers. They see them as they walk hastily over the turf, for they already have them in their ear eyes. I once took a walk with the late Professor Eaton of Yale. He was just then specially interested in the mosses, and he found them all kinds everywhere. I can see him yet, every few minutes upon his knees, adjusting his eyeglasses before some rare specimen. The beauty he found in them, and pointed out to me, kindled my enthusiasm also. I once spent a summer day at the mountain home of a well-known literary woman and editor. She lamented the absence of birds about her house. I named a half dozen or more I had heard or seen in her trees within an hour. The indigo bird, the purple finch, the yellow bird, the veery thrush, the red-eyed vireo, the song sparrow. Do you mean to say you have seen or heard all these birds while sitting here on my porch? she inquired. I really have, I said. I do not see them or hear them, she replied, and yet I want to very much. No, said I, you only want to see and hear them. You must have the bird in your heart before you can find it in the bush. I was sitting in the front of a farmhouse one day in company with the local Nimrod. In a maple tree in front of us I saw the great crested flycatcher. I called the hunter's attention to it and asked him if he had ever seen the bird before. No, he had not. It was not a new bird to him. It was a new bird to him but he probably had seen it scores of times, seen it without regarding it. It was not the game he was in quest of, and his eye heeded it not. Human and artificial sounds and objects thrust themselves upon us. They are within our spheres, so to speak, but the life of nature we must meet halfway. It is shy, withdrawn, and blends itself with a vast, neutral background. We must be initiated, it is an order the secrets of which are well guarded.